Good afternoon, everybody. Good uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Laura De Dominicis uh, from uh, DG Regio. I'm an economic analyst and uh, welcome to this uh, second uh, series, second academic lectures that now back since 2016, DG Regio organizes together with the uh, RSA. And uh, this is one of the multiple activities we have together with the RSA. Uh, like uh, some uh, winter schools, like the last one that was organized in Sevilla together with the GRC, or um, special sessions during the annual conferences. So this is a very long standing and very positive, uh, let's say, cooperation we have uh, with the academic uh, community. And we here in the commission, we always are eager to hear what uh, the research um, is uh, proposing to innovate, to develop uh, policy, regional policy and urban policy in the EU. So today, uh, just a few words I want to, um, we will have a lecture uh, by Professor Michaela Trippel. She will uh, really introduce us to, into a topic which is really, really relevant at the moment about regions in transitions and regions towards uh, a, green, a, a green path, a green transition, which in a moment when we are trying to move towards what is called a twin transition, a digital, a green transition of the EU economy, a sustainable at the same time, even in the following of the COVID pandemic, it's more than ever, let's say, actual. And Michele Tripoli is full professor at the University of Vienna. And she has worked uh, very extensively on the economic geography of innovations, on labor mobility. She has worked uh, with us, with uh, our colleagues at the GRC on smart specialization. And I think she will have lots to tell us. And after her lecture, uh, there will be a discussion by Professor David Hall, who is the Emeritus Professor of Human Geography at the University of Hull in the UK. And he also has studies extensively on the interaction between the economy, the environment, and with a focus on the local and the regional level. So I don't want to steal more time to the two speakers and then especially to Evelyn, who will, uh, as, uh, really, who will chair today the session uh, the, and uh, will be here on behalf of the RSA. Just some housekeeping rules. We would, uh, as this is, will be a recorded uh, meeting, it will be made available on the platform of the RSA. We would appreciate if all the questions are kept for the end. There will be a 45 minutes presentation by Professor, uh, Professor sorry, that's Italian, by Professor Triple, followed by the discussion and then we will open to your Q&A through the chat box. So I think this is uh, all in terms of our skipping rules. I just pass the floor now to Evelyn, who is the Vice President of the Rights of RSA, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Uh, also, uh, on behalf of URSA, the European Regional Science Association, I would like to welcome you very much to this uh, second uh, academic URSA region academic lecture of this year. Um, I'm very happy uh, that you all joined um, uh, this lecture uh, and we look forward very much to have uh, Professor Michaela Triple and Professor David Gibbs sharing their thoughts and insights on green industrial path development and, and regional challenges. And uh, it's like uh, Laura already said, a very relevant topic and it's also at the core of the European Regional Science Association as since for us it's really important to enhance regional science across Europe uh, and by, by stimulating research uh, that really helps to implement uh, solutions. And I think that's also what's very much needed for this topic, but also what at a lecture of uh, Professor uh, Triple will focus on. Um, and so uh, another um, big uh, important aim of, of URSA is to also collaborate and facilitate um, uh, the collaboration between institutes like uh, Regio, DJ, DJ Regio, but also the OECD or national governments, for example. And indeed, we use summer schools. We use this, um, we have our yearly com conference, our yearly congress, which will this year focus on visions and scenarios for a resilient Europe. And it takes place, fortunately, still online, but between the 24th, 24th and 27th of August, uh, where we also cover topics that relate uh, closely to uh, the topic of today. And, and of course, uh, the academic lecture is also really, uh, we, we are very uh, proud and, and it's very valuable for us to organize, uh, jointly organize these lectures. And also we're very happy to have people uh, like we have today to give us their first, uh, the, the, give us the, 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 their first ideas and their first insights. And I look forward to a very fruitful exchange. 
uh, so we can uh, really um, further insights in science, but also in, in solutions in, in regions uh, and in the, in the European Union. So uh, without uh, any further ado, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, Michaela Trippel. Um, and uh, you, yeah, please uh, share your screen with us. Thank you, it looks uh, very good. And the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot for the uh, invitation and uh, thanks a lot for the kind introduction, Evelyn and, and Laura. It's really a big pleasure to give a talk in this lecture series. So thanks a lot for this opportunity. And uh, let me add that I am really thrilled that uh, David agreed to act as discussant today. I know his work very well and I'm really looking forward to his comments and questions. And of course, I'm also looking forward to the comments and questions that will be put in the chat and uh, raised after our two interventions. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, green regional industrial path development and challenge oriented regional innovation systems. And I want to give you an overview on the most recent work that uh, I have done on these topics together with colleagues in Vienna and together with Arne Isaksen from the University of Akter in Norway and other colleagues. And since this lecture series is about EU regions in industrial decisions, uh, transitions, I would like to start with a few more general thoughts on regional restructuring and the context in which um, uh, this takes place. So as you of course know, many regions are currently uh, confronted with a multiple crises that pose significant transformation challenges, right? So trans transformation challenges that result from so-called slow burn changes, so problems and dynamics that have been unfolding uh, for some time, like the ongoing climate warming emergency and other environmental problems, or the fourth industrial revolution that is driven by artificial intelligence, new materials, advanced digital platforms, and so on. And there are growing inequalities um, as well. And there are not only the slow burn changes, so from time to time, regions also face sudden shocks that require responses and restructuring efforts. And the current coronavirus pandemic, I think is an excellent uh, example for this, as we all know. So, and given these multiple challenges and crises of climate change, COVID-19, inequality, there is a growing view that policymakers should take the opportunity to build back better. And others argue that, well, this would suggest a rather limited ambition because the task should be to, fill, to build forward better. So to a new regime of economic and um, social development that tackles the present uh, problems and crisis. And I think it's obvious that this discussion and this partly disagreement also reflects different understandings of uh, regional resilience, where many argue that bouncing back to pre-crisis patterns isn't the right thing to do, and bouncing forward in the sense of, you know, reorienting existing structures without any discussion of that directionality of change shouldn't be an option either. So we should rather strive for building up capacities for transformative resilience and build sustainable structures in response to the so-called grand societal challenges. So I think the message here is that we must not only look at structural change, but should also consider to what extent these transformations are to the benefit of society and uh, the environment. And in my lecture, I want to zoom in on one particular challenge um, that many regions in Europe and elsewhere are facing, and this is uh, green restructuring. And there are, well, many, many visions, many interpretations of green restructuring, and in fact, many options for transitioning to a greener economy, as nicely shown by, by David, uh, by my discussant. And uh, one way to interpret and to conceptualize green restructuring is through the notion of green regional industrial path development, which will be in the focus of my lecture. And this notion covers both the rise of new green industries and the greening of existing industries. So just to provide you 
right at the outset with the definition on clarification of, well, of how we understand this notion. I will talk more about it later. Let me first um, say a few words about the policy context of green path development activities. These activities clearly benefit from a, a favorable policy environment. So just think of the European Green Deal, Europe's public policy response to the climate change. There is an increasing uh, mission orientation, challenge orientation of innovation policies. And um, then of course, uh, the proposed shift of smart specialization to smart specialization for sustainable and inclusive growth. So uh, a shift to uh, place-based innovation policies for uh, sustainability. So there is quite a, a hype around green industries based on the assumption that they would help to reconcile environmental and economic challenges. Uh, this view is not uncontested, but still many scientists and policymakers share uh, a strong belief that green industries would have a positive ecological impact so because they develop products, solutions, technologies that help to reduce carbon emissions and enhance uh, energy efficiency, and prevent the loss of biodiversity and uh, ecosystem services. And an important question here is, of course, where are these ecological benefits, these alleged ecological benefits created? So in the regions that host green industries or are they created elsewhere because the green industries in the region are export industries and their products and solutions are applied elsewhere. So I think this is one uh, relevant question. Another aspect um, concerns the economic benefits of green industries. So green industries are uh, often seen as a new source of economic growth and employment. So they are associated with uh, economic benefits. And again, the question is, uh, where are these opportunities uh, and jobs created? So where does new green uh, path development take place? Uh, only in innovative regions or also in less developed regions where, as we all know, the need to identify new sources of industrial development is really a pressing policy uh, issue. Well, the evidence seems to suggest a highly uneven geography of green path development. And what I would like to do in the next 40 minutes or so is uh, to provide some explanations for this uneven geographical patterns. So why regions differ in their capacities to develop green paths, taking into consideration that there are different forms of green path development. This is an important addition. So, and this will lead me uh, to take a closer look uh, at the preconditions for developing green paths in region and what is enabling and what is con constraining their development. I will also talk uh, about the processes that underpin green path development. And uh, finally, I also want to deal with the question of how green paths affect other parts of the regional economy and if and how they help to solve um, place-based challenges and problems. And I will give you an overview on yeah, a recent conceptual and also empirical work on these issues. And I will also talk a bit about the policy implications or the policy conclusions that uh, can be drawn from this work. So uh, where and how do green paths emerge? It's a key question, right? So what do our theories tell us? What does the economic geography and regional studies literature tell us? Let me start with evolutionary economic geography, which is really a powerful approach to explain the rise and growth of industries in regions. And well, um, evolutionary economic geography, so EEG in short, tells us that new green industries and uh, new economic activities emerge out of favorable regional environments. So of enabling conditions that are embodied in pre-existing related capabilities in pre-existing economic and technological um, structures. So new paths grow out of old ones is the message here. And this work offers some really convincing conceptual arguments 
Um, and there is also empirical evidence, so some recent papers that show that new green activities are more likely to develop uh, in regions where related capabilities are available. And that's a sound. Um, and what I also want to add is that it were that this work offers a, a very clear policy advice. So no? a policy maker should promote related diversification processes into new green industries. And that's a sound argument, but uh, from a conceptual perspective, I think it's also fair to say that this approach tends to overemphasize endogenous processes and provide somewhat narrow firm-centered and uh, knowledge-centered explanations. And when we take a closer look at the policy implications, uh, it seems that, well, EEG has little to offer for places with limited diversification potentials, right? Or let's put it like this, the policy implications for regions with limited diversification, related diversification potentials, so the policy Im implications for these places are less clear. So what should less developed regions do? What should locked in regions do? Do we need to think about other ways to develop new green activities? Do we need to move beyond relatedness and diversification thinking? So then there are also more comprehensive frameworks, uh, broader conceptualizations based on attempts to combine uh, evolutionary economic geography with other approaches, such as the global production network approach or a technological uh, innovation system approach, the multi-level perspective and the regional innovation system approach. And this has led to a number of interesting insights uh, and also policy relevant findings. So one important achievement of this more recent literature is that um, it offers, it really offers a differentiated view on green path development that goes well beyond the related unrelated diversification dichotomy. So it draws attention to more forms of green path development. It also draws attention to the fact that it is not only firms, but um, also many other stakeholders, many non-firm actors who are engaged in green path development. And one needs to understand their motivations and one needs to understand um, the, the conflicts that might arise given different motivation and interests. And we need to understand the ways in which they contribute to green path development. So then this more recent literature also helps to overcome uh, knowledge-centered views. So uh, don't get me wrong, knowledge is without any doubts an important assets, but there are other assets. Um, there are also other assets that need to be modified or need to be created to develop green paths. And this needs to be taken into consideration also by policymakers. And finally, it draws attention to multiscalar processes and uh, interregional uh, dependencies, and thus it avoids an overemphasis uh, of uh, local processes. <clears throat> so then, let me move on and uh, let me briefly discuss why it is important to distinguish between different forms of green path development, also from a policy perspective. So there is quite a lot of conceptual work and there are also empirical studies that show that uh, green path development can unfold in many different ways. Um, so new green paths can grow out of the existing regional industrial base, as we know from uh, evolutionary economic uh, geography um, models and empirical studies, but they can also rely on activities by non-firm actors, such as universities and uh, research institutes. So the, the research infrastructure in regions can be a breeding ground for green paths, as shown, for example, by, uh, by Anetana for the fuel cell industry. New green paths can also be based on exogenous sources, on the inflow um, of uh, non-local assets, the arrival of multinational companies. There is a very nice empirical um, work by Christian Pins and colleagues, for example, on the, on the water recycling industry in, 
in Chinese region. So this is another important form uh, of, of green path development. And um, <laughs> importantly, uh, this is often forgotten in, in the discussion. So green path development activities can also take place within established industries. So the greening of the, the uh, greening of steel production would be a, a good example here. It's a hot topic in Austria and of course also a hot topic in many other uh, countries and regions. So there are um, several typologies that really seek to capture all these different types of path development and they differentiate between, between many different forms of so this uh, ranging from path creation to path importation to extension, dissolution. And I don't have to die, the time to go into detail here. Uh, I would rather like to show you the topology that we have used in our, our recent work. So in, 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 our, in the work that we have done, we um, have distinguished between four forms and three of them describe uh, different ways in which new green industries might emerge in regions. So the most radical form is green path creation. This is defined as the rise of totally a new green of a totally new green industry. This could result, for example, from groundbreaking scientific research, but there are other sources as well. And I think a nice example here would be the photovoltaic industry in in German regions, or also the potable water industry in California. Then there is green path importation, which is very different from path creation. So green path importation refers to the establishment of a green industry that is new to the region, um, resulting, for example, from the arrival of, of firms or the inflow of skilled labor, inflow of knowledge, inflow of other assets from outside the region. And a um, good example would be the, the uh, the emergence of the wind industry in Northeast uh, England. And finally, there is green path diversification, which means that a new green industry grows out from pre-existing green or even brown industries. So this is the, uh, uh, the, the argument or the form that is identified by conventional evolutionary economic geography models. And as an example, uh, for a green path diversification, I could offer the offshore wind industry in Norway, which emerged out of the oil and gas sector. And then, and this should not be forgotten, as mentioned before, uh, we should also pay attention to the greening of existing industries, so green path renewal, as we call it. And this refers to interpath changes that involve, for example, the introduction of green technologies, organizational innovations or business models that introduce eco-efficient uh, practices in uh, mature sectors. So this casts light on the different ways in which green path development could take place in regions, right? Or uh, let's put it like this, regions can develop green paths in different forms. There is not just uh, one way, there are indeed different forms and depending on the form, uh, very different sources, mechanisms and actors are involved. And um, obviously there are also different degrees of relatedness to pre-existing uh, regional structures. And this is also um, an important uh, message to policymakers and other stakeholders. So they could ask themselves, okay, what potential, uh, what potential does the region have? So not only for related diversification, but also for green path creation or for uh, uh, green path importation for uh, green path renewal. So then um, let's move on and let's discuss what we know and what we should know about driving forces and, and barriers. So. Um, about enabling factors and constraining factors of green path development in regional context. Well, conventional models tell us that we need to take a look at pre-existing regional industrial structures because they would help us to identify enabling and constraining factors. And this is without any doubts an important argument, but we must not ignore that 
enabling and constraining factors can um, also be found in the wider systemic environment. So from a, a regional innovation system perspective, it's not only the, the pre-existing uh, industrial structures that deserve attention, but also uh, the organizational support structures and the institutional configurations. And as we know from a, a lot of work um, on uh, different regions in Europe and elsewhere, these, these place-based stru structures, they differ enormously between regions, which implies that the opportunities and constraints that reside within these structures are unevenly distributed across space. They differ a lot between core regions, which are characterized by thick and diversified structures, um, and non-core regions, which often suffer from either over-specialized um, or thin um, structures. So then let me be a bit uh, uh, more precise and let me uh, elaborate a bit on how uh, these historically grown structures might matter and also what factors are uh, important um, in this context. So we have done a, a literature review on, um, on the three dimension that, dimensions that I mentioned earlier. And this uh, literature review shows that, so with regard to pre-existing regional industrial structures, that both uh, pre-existing green industries, other industries like the ID industry, and pre-existing dirty industries can constitute an enabling environment for a green industry emergence. So they can provide a platform for um, opportunity-driven and uh, challenge-driven development process, processes. But there is also a lot of evidence that pre-existing industries can form, can form a constraining environment due to a high degree of institutionalization, uh, active resistance to change, competition over skilled workers, financial assets, policy uh, support, and also markets. And then understanding regional innovation systems as um, open systems, which is important to mention, um, and zooming in uh, on uh, the non-local connections that regional in, uh, industrial structures have. We found <clears throat> that these interregional connections are really important because they uh, can help to prevent lock-in. Um, but uh, at the same time, they can also be a source of lock-in. Huh? So if regions are, for example, inserted into unsustainable production uh, linkages, unsustainable value change uh, linkages. And then there is uh, also quite a lot of work uh, that has taken stock um, of both the opportunities and constraints that are found in the organizational support structures and in the institutional configurations of regions. So there is work that shows how actors such as universities, intermediaries, financial organizations, so how these these actors facilitate green path development by mobilizing knowledge assets, financial assets, other assets, not only uh, within the region, but also from higher spatial scales. And uh, again, there is also evidence that they can constrain green path, uh, green industries, if they lack the capabilities to support um, um, uh, green path development activities, or when they have vested interests and thus support um, other industries. And last but not least, uh, institutional configuration. Again, there is um, work that shows how formal institutions like laws and regulations and uh, also informal institutions, such as joint visions, um, enable green path development, but there is of course also evidence on how institutional configurations constrain green industries. So just think of the, all the regulations and norms and sub subsidies that uh, still favor uh, uh, dirty industries. So there is clear evidence that it's not only the industrial structures, but also the, the wider systemic environment that matters when we talk about uh, uh, preconditions and uh, also barriers to green path development. But what's perhaps even more interesting um, 
uh, then, then discussing all these findings from the literature review is to take a step back and to recall that uh, the system elements that I just mentioned, so the firms, universities, uh, intermediaries, um, public sector actors, and so on. So these system elements, um, they can be understood as the, the localized structures that form or reproduce assets through a variety of system functions. And here it's again important to stress that it's not only knowledge and skills, but also other assets like financial assets, legitimacy, um, other resources. And it's also crucial to emphasize that the structures um, and the assets they provide, so they are often well adapted to the region's current economic structure, right? So they reflect previous rounds of uh, industrial path development. And as I have argued before, these historically grown structures might either enable or constrain green industries, which leads to the question. So under enabling conditions, so if um, um, assets are available that could be adapted to the needs of green industries, so how are these assets, how are the opportunities and potentials transformed into green path development? And under constraining uh, preconditions, for example, if assets are missing, how are such barriers overcome? And one way to deal with these questions is to zoom in on the modification of um, assets. Um, modification of the regional asset base. And there is a very nice um, work by um, McKinnon and, and colleagues, um, which uh, suggests that uh, local assets can only promote new path development if these assets are identified, used and modified. And this is really an, um, an important argument. So putting existing assets to alternative use. But we think that this needs to be complemented by focusing on how uh, actors create new assets, how they access and transplant non-local assets. Um, so first and foremost, uh, human and industrial assets and how they destruct uh, old assets. And this could help to better understand the uneven geography of green path development because this, the uneven geography of, um, of such activities would then not only reflect the fact that regions differ in their endowment of assets, but also that regions uh, feature different capacities to create new assets, to import uh, non-local assets, and to reuse or even destroy existing assets. So uh, uh, let me um, just give you a few examples what uh, asset modification could be about and how policymakers can shape such, such processes. So as this table on the, on the left side shows, there are uh, yeah, obviously many different uh, examples uh, for policy actions that are um, oriented towards uh, uh, modifying the regional asset base and this rate uh, ranges from new cluster projects, um, um, changes in, in, in public tenders to um, policy support initiatives that uh, entail a protection of emerging markets for the products of green industries. There is also evidence for uh, policy driven, uh, for policy driven creation of markets and legitimacy. And again, we must not forget the the crucially, the, the crucial thing of that from time to time, it's also important to disrupt uh, institutional setups, for example, by withdrawing subsidies for um, uh, non sustainable industries and activities. Um, but there are, of course, not only these more policy related asset modification processes, it's really important to add that multiple actors. Um, at multiple spatial scales have an influence on asset modification for uh, green path development. Um, and uh, again, here are some examples what this might involve. So this could, uh, uh, could involve the 
creation of new intermediary organizations or establishment of new re, uh, research and educational programs could invo uh, involve the adaptation of infrastructure, lobbying for, um, for new regulations, for changes in existing regulations. So there are many, many different examples that can be found in the literature and that we could also observe in our own empirical work. And uh, an important question is, of course, also how are these different asset modification activities by different actors, policy actors, other actors, how are they orchestrated and coordinated? And uh, this is uh, yeah, still poorly understood. It's indeed a, a key question for, for future research. Um, good. Um, and let's move on and um, let's discuss um, another core question that is, yeah, again, unfortunately, still poorly understood, but is indeed crucial. And this is how new path development activities translate into regional uh, economic development. So what do we know and what should we know about uh, the regional socioeconomic uh, effects of green path development activities? As we often assume that new paths are associated with positive regional economic outcomes, so we equate new path development with a successful development for the entire regions, and we tend to ignore that um, they could also cause problems. They could give rise to new forms of um, interregional um, inequalities. And my argument here is that if we want to understand the regional socio uh, economic effects of green paths, then we, uh, if we want to understand these effects, then we need to, um, to pay attention to the uh, impacts that green paths have on other parts of the regional economy and how they affect other regional industrial paths located in the region. And uh, we also need to pay attention if and how uh, green paths help to solve um, place based uh, challenges or problems. So we need to move beyond the single path view that still dominates in, um, in, in research and also in the policy world, I would say. Um, so we need to overcome the single path view and we uh, need to pay attention to uh, interpath uh, relations. And we also need to understand the role that green paths might might play in so-called challenge-oriented uh, regional innovation systems. So uh, how do green path development activities affect other paths uh, in the region? Uh, this depends on the nature of interpath relations. So a new green path can, of course, create opportunities and uh, economic benefits for other paths in the region. So this would, uh, um, would reflect um, synergetic interpath relations and this might work through um, yeah, market linkages or value chain linkages, uh, innovation networks, other paths in the region might benefit from a green path because it offers the opportunity to produce complementary products. And, um, we must not ignore that, um, and this would be the um, my, my, my second point, we must not ignore that new paths can also hamper other paths. So they can create losses and they can lead to conflicts and inequality, which um, could be due to uh, competitive interpath relations. Huh? So there might be competition over uh, assets such as skilled workers, uh, financial investment, policy support, um, and also competition over markets, of course. So I think in, in the respect of time, I will um, skip the empirical uh, examples that I um, have prepared. We can talk about it uh, later if you want. Would rather like to uh, sum up um, um, and, uh, and argue that, um, so, New, new green paths may pro produce direct economic benefits, right? But there might also be other effects. So effects that unfold 
beyond the new green path because of the existence of uh, interpath relations. And taking these effects together, <clears throat> we find that new green paths may have variegated outcomes, so with benefits and losses often unevenly distributed among firms and, uh, and people. And as um, uh, Boyle and colleagues put it in a, in a paper that just came out, I think, last month, um, this, this discussion about the, the variegated consequences of green path development uh, also raises awareness for the, the question of which paths are desirable for um, a certain region. And this is a question that is really not easy to answer and is probably a, 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 political, a political question. But again, we can talk about it uh, later if you want. So to, to sum up, interpath relations are key to understand what kind of regional development is generated uh, by green paths. And um, in terms of policy implications, so what does that mean for, for policymakers or what could that uh, imply for policymakers? So an obvious uh, conclusion that one can draw is to consider interpath relations and. Uh, uh, variegated outcomes of green paths in decisions about which path uh, to promote. All right. Um, so uh, as mentioned already several times, uh, so green paths might create new challenges uh, for a region. They could produce inequality, so uh, reflecting a potential uh, dark side of green path development, as McKinnon and colleagues put it. Uh, but what about their potential to solve uh, place-based challenges? And in order to, to answer this question, one needs to look at uh, the role that they could play in so-called challenge-oriented regional innovation systems. So this is a very a new concept. It's an attempt to, to reorient the regional innovation system approach and also regional innovation policies to um, so-called grand societal challenges, or to be more precise, to place specific manifestations of, uh, um, of uh, grand societal challenges. And um, this is really important. No? Uh, because we know, of course, that different places have different exposures to environmental and societal challenges. So in a, in a tourism region, for example, climate change might create problems that are very different from, from those in an industrial region or from those in a, in a big city. So um, um, challenge-oriented regional innovation system uh, can be understood as the, the wider regional framework uh, that reflects the capacity of regions to address multiple and often interrelated uh, challenges that a region is facing. And it pays attention to how uh, actors, so old ones uh, and also uh, new um, innovation actors that have been neglected in previous studies, so how um, actors try to to solve these challenges by mobilizing other actors and uh, mobilizing assets and institutions, but also including new actors and creating new assets and engaging in, uh, um, in uh, institutional uh, change. So, and uh, developing a green path uh, can indeed be one of those solutions no, for this uh, place-based challenges, but there might be other initiatives as well. So, and the question is really, do these initiatives and the green paths that are developed in the region, so other challenge-oriented innovations, do they complement each other or do they contradict each other? It can of course also be unrelated. So just to give you an, an example, um, so uh, just think of a, a, a less developed region that faces environmental problems resulting from climate change and uh, which also faces serious socioeconomic problems because the, uh, the unemployment rate is really high. So in, in such a region, then activities that 
try to, to battle climate change can, of course, lead to job creation uh, in new green fields, so if new green path development activities unfold in the region, but it might also um, lead to, uh, to, to further job losses due to the uh, closure of, uh, of Turkey industries, right? So when tackling the environmental problems. And for innovation policies or for challenge-oriented innovation policies to be effective, it's really important to take such uh, relationships uh, into account. So um, this is my last slide already. So, um, but, but <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not running off, out of time. Uh, that's, um, uh, that's good to know. Um, five, five minutes still, so you're doing a... Five minutes, okay, perfect. So uh, what conclusions can we draw for innovation policies of which, um, what are the insights for, um, for smart specialization? Um, well, and the first uh, conclusion is that, um, you know, when we talk about um, policy prioritization processes, um, I think uh, one of the obvious conclusions is that um, such priorita prioritization processes should not only be uh, based on the entrepreneurial opportunities that could be found in a region, but also on the place specific problems or challenges. And this holds um, uh, particularly true for less developed regions. So we, we really know a lot about the geography of innovation, right? Or geography of solution, if you want. And uh, we don't know that much about the um, um, geography of problems, or let's put it like this, the geography of problems should really, um, should really play a, a role when we think about new forms uh, of, of um, uh, regional innovation policies. So uh, I also want to argue in favor of building up uh, challenge-oriented regional innovation uh, systems, so uh, innovation systems that, that support actors to solve place-specific problems. And well, developing green industries can be one of the solutions. Uh, but this needs to be seen in the context of, of multiple and party interconnected problems, right? Um, and uh, I also want to, uh, to stress that when we talk about policy initiatives to develop green paths, then as I mentioned before, we have to pay, of course, attention that there are different forms of uh, green path development that uh, such activities are how such activities are um, are driven and how they are constrained by place specific structures and we need to pay attention to the fact that they involve a modification of the regional asset base and um, so when we talk about modification of the regional asset base we need to take into consideration that this might create new challenges and inequalities because um, the regional asset base, uh, so more often than not, is not only of relevance to, uh, to one industry, but uh, uh, of several ones. So uh, it changes the asset base for other industries as well. And this is why we need to pay close attention to the interpath relations. And then uh, my last point uh, would be that, um, so when we think about developing challenge-oriented regional innovation systems and uh, promoting green path development in, in less favored regions. So is, is that possible or how likely, uh, how likely is it that uh, challenge-oriented innovation systems uh, can emerge in less developed regions? Do they have the institutional capacities to develop such innovation systems? And as we know from our own research on, on smart specialization and how smart specialization, uh, how this approach has been taken up in, in less developed regions, then I would argue there are some glimmers of hope. So we have indeed seen that uh, these regions have begun to build up um, institutional structures that could favor such an approach. But what we have also seen in our work is that there, of course, still many uh, 
let's put it like this, issues with re, uh, um, related to uh, prioritize, prioritization, to the inclusion of stakeholders, um, to multi-level governance um, relations, to autonomy challenges, as we called it. So there are still many issues that uh, need to be solved, but um, to have a, a positive ending of, of this talk, uh, I would say that, um, there are, uh, there is some hope that this could work. So this is an, uh, a list of the of the papers I I, I uh, have been drawing on in my lecture, and then I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, uh, Michaela, for this uh, very uh, interesting and and well presented uh, story about um, green path development. Um, I would like to give the floor now to David Gibbs for his response to your uh, to your great lecture. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Um, just to start off with, um, <clears throat> um, I don't have a PowerPoint for this. Um, I did get to see, um, Michaela was very kind enough to send me um, a copy, advanced copy of her slides. Um, so I, I responded to that, but I, I did think, well, she may alter the, what she says a little bit. So I, I didn't want to... Uh, um, I didn't really want to pre-guess what she was going to say, and, and I, I have been scribbling away here on, on my notes to alter things. Um, and I'm happy to provide those notes to anybody who wants them. Um, I'll put my email in the, uh, in, in the chat. So to start off with, yeah, thank you very much to Michaela. I thought that was really interesting and a very comprehensive account um, of uh, ideas around green path development. Uh, I think, it, it, you know, certainly for the regional studies community, I think it is one of the... Uh, key areas that people are starting to become much more interested in than they have done in the past. I think one of the key points she makes is that whereas the path creation literature originally saw firms and entrepreneurs as the main source of new path creation, I think more recently there has been this recognition that path creation needs to include um, agency and actions and interventions by those uh, beyond firms to create paths, alter paths and Include involving both intra and extra regional resources. And that, that can involve state actors, public policy, institutional entrepreneurs, and place leadership, and all, all the rest of it. I think all of that offers local actors opportunities to initiate change from uh, within. But I think we still lack um, the detailed knowledge about what actors do to create and exploit opportunities, as, as Michaela said, um, in different contexts. Why do they do this in some places, but not in others? Why are the effects of such efforts um, alter between apparently different uh, places? Excuse me. And I think whilst Michaela has covered um, a very comprehensive list of issues to do with green path development, I'll just raise four points. I think kind of hopefully expand and add on to what, to what she said, and I'll, I'll draw a little bit upon, upon some of my own um, my own research. First point I'll make is I think is is the key role. What I think is the key role of policy. Um, Obviously, Michaela's covered the influence of EU policy and the European Green Deal. And I think those policies help to legitimate these uh, Green Path development policies at a local scale. And I'll say more about legitimation as an issue in a minute or two. So I think all that provides a window of opportunity uh, for local actors to engage with the strategic needs of them. So, for example, um, I know uh, Marco. Um, uh, and Nina Susubin in Finland, um, they've argued that regional policymakers and uh, place leaders in Finland draw upon um, a national mindset and a shared policy ambition of a green growth agenda to justify why they're creating their own. So I think those kind of public policies provide a generic direction, a leg legitimate context in which to operate. I think one thing that we haven't talked about, or um, kind of didn't talk about quite as much, is the importance of national policy. I mean, yes, EU policy is important, although not unfortunately in the UK, um, but I think it is important to look at the national context. Um, I think one thing national state policies need is consistency. Um, I've done some work in the UK looking at the green building industry. Um, and initially there was an attempt to, not at the regional scale particularly, but an attempt to try to shift the direction of green building in the UK onto a much more 
environmental path to try and uh, to have a shift towards zero carbon homes. Over the years, that policy framework has fluctuated considerably, in, in part due to changes in government, but also to changes within the, uh, the, the ruling Conservative Party. And what that's done is create uncertainty, uh, changing levels of support. And certainly in, in my work, talking, talking to firms, they became very disillusioned that they were going to receive um, any, any support, that they were reluctant to invest in a situation where they, they couldn't see there was going to be certainty for the future. So I think in, this, in that particular case, path development has, has unraveled, um, partly due to a lack of government commitment, but partly some of the things that Michaela mentioned, um, incumbent firm opposition, uh, volume house building sector and developers in the UK didn't particularly want to go down this, this path and lobbied quite actively to, to try to pre prevent it. So I think the, the point there is that green industrial path development may not necessarily be a smooth process. Uh, green paths can be dismantled as well as constructed. I think that that takes me on to my second point, but we can actually see a negative path development. Uh, I think that may be especially the case for uh, green path importation, where uh, regions are relying upon imported technology which may perhaps have limited potential for regional growth. I think one thing that struck me in reading some of the work on this is, it, um, perhaps it's just my age, but um, um, I think a lot of us seem to have forgotten uh, the lessons about branch plant investment in peripheral regions in the 1970s and the 1980s, where again, some of these new technologies were seen as being the solution or at least a partial solution to some of the regional problems. And, and that you know, didn't necessarily work out that well. I think much of the emphasis in the literature as well, the green path development literature so far anyway, um, has been upon positive development paths, less attention paid to negative outcomes. So there may be path downgrading or these new industries may have failed to become established. Um, I've done, done some work recently on offshore wind as well, um, both in the UK and uh, parts of Northwest Germany. I think you, you can kind of see that there. I mean, there's a, big claims made for the offshore wind sector in, in, in my local area um, of Hull and, and, and the Humber. And yes, things have happened, but not to the same extent as, as was originally planned. So um, the negative path development can involve the decline of a regional industry, that's in terms of employment and capital, capital accumulation, as well as sometimes adverse impacts on the regional asset base. Third point, going back to the, something I mentioned earlier, is ideas around acceptance and legitimation. Now, obviously, shifting global imperatives around climate change have led to, to broad acceptance and justification for green industrial path development, which I think wouldn't have been the case, say, 10, 20 years ago. I mean, you, you'd have more of an uphill struggle to convince, to convince uh, policymakers that they should be engaging in this kind of activity. Legitimation, when I'm talking about here, is um, Again, building upon some of the work that Michaela referenced by um, Danny McKinnon and his colleagues at Newcastle University, where the legitimation is about the narratives and strategies uh, developed by supporters of these emerging technologies and industries. I think those dynamics of legitimation influence the ability to mobilise resources for new forms of economic development and acquiring political influence uh, to do this. And, uh, and McKinnon I, and McKinnon and his colleagues identify. Uh, four narratives in the offshore wind industry about combating climate change, energy security, cost reduction, creating economic value, in particular in terms of jobs and new investment. And they argue that those four factors have, have helped supporters um, drive their um, narrative of, of why we should be investing in offshore wind in, in, in the UK. Uh, so that helps those sectors gain legitimacy and in their case of offshore wind, they argue um, it's particularly important because it, they're seen as sources of growth, investment and jobs in the peripheral regions in, in which they have been predominantly um, created. But so certainly then a supportive environment created through EU policy and national policy has enabled local actors to justify their green strategies and you can legitimate those to other local stakeholders as a solution for unemployment. Um, so local actors have often drawn upon um, re what, what we might call um, what we might call um, um, regional imaginaries. 
those um, narratives and visions employed by actors of a transformed local economy to justify their strategy and to try to enroll other actors. And to give you an example of that, um, a more concrete example, uh, in my local area, and I've mentioned off offshore uh, wind, but there has been um, a strong drive by policymakers, whether that's local government, um, the private sector, a range of uh, institutions, including my own university, to try to reimagine the area. Um, it's a relatively depressed and peripheral area, but they've tried to reimagine it to calling it the energy estuary. It's, there's a, a big um, estuary on the, the River Humber. Um, trying to turn the area's high content of existing brown path, energy generators, fuel refiners, and gas importers, turning that into a refill asset to develop a nationally important low carbon hub for offshore wind, carbon capture and storage, the hydrogen economy, et cetera, et cetera. So there's been an attempt to rethink and, and reposition uh, the local area um, within this and try to reimagine what the local area might be like in the future uh, to try to reposition it as a, as a um, really as um, a dynamic hub for these new forms of economic activity, rather than being the, the kind of the peripheral and depressed place that, that is often uh, seen as its image. Lastly, um, uh, I'll raise the point, I think we, this is so clever. To me, this is one of the key points, I think, in, in, in ideas around uh, green path development. And, and Michaela has raised this, but I think what are the alleged, or what are the ecological um, benefits in all of this? Um, so does green path development actually address environmental problems? Now, I think from, from academic, and particularly from policymakers' perspectives, there has been this general expectation that green economy developments and path creation can result in both positive economic and environmental impacts. Um, I think we can question some of the economic impacts as well, but I wasn't going to focus on that here. But I think in reality, if you look at uh, local and regional green economy and green path development strategies, they're largely seen locally as economic development strategies. Uh, issues around social, environmental sustainability are often much less important and certainly receive much less prominence um, in, um, in policy measures. Uh, I think the, the predominant form of the green economy that has been developed so far at least is largely one of ecological modernization, uh, relying upon um, the technical solutions that can be fairly easily accommodated by existing uh, governance and socio-technical formations. And I think that raise, does raise questions, which we, we obviously don't have time to address this in, in any detail here, as, as to whether the predominant forms of green path development that we're seeing are actually adequate to address environmental concerns, or do we need other, other kinds of approaches? Certainly in some of my own, own work, which has looked at um, regions in, in the UK, in Germany, and, and in Austria, I think most of the green economy strategies, are, as I said, are mainly seen as economic development strategies. Um, so they're seeing fairly gradual improvements rather than any kind of disruptive innovation and only incremental change rather than um, uh, more uh, theoretical change. So it's, it's those changes which can be more um, readily, al readily aligned with the dominant regime within the area and, and can easily be accommodated I think what we often find, or what I've often found, is um, um, in many areas, the green economy itself is often is often a niche sector. If you look at some uh, local and regional areas, um, green policy, and see that in the context of wider economic development policy, um, the green economy is just one sector, um, it, or seen as being a, a sector, and we then go off into uh, a whole bunch of other more conventional types of development. Uh, some of which may not be very green. So, for example, um, I looked at the, the example of Styria in Austria, where there is a, a big green drive, but there's also support for the automotive industry, support for the steel industry. Uh, the energy estuary I mentioned earlier is an important location for chemicals in the chemical industry. And again, that's, a, that's another sector that is receiving support, but it may not be a very green path. Uh, similarly, I looked at parts of East Anglia, which had a, a, a big green strategy at one point, but they were also supporting the development 
um, of the nuclear power industry. So I think there's some contradictions. There can be contradictions there. Um, I think with you know green path development being seen as just one more sector that we can try to encourage, and it, but it may not be uh, altering the basis of the economy. Obviously, it depends on what we want to do. But I think if we're, uh, I think I kind of end by saying, by saying really uh, that where's where's the green in green path development? Um, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, David, for um, for this extensive and very uh, uh, with a with a lot of information and a lot of insights that nicely contributes to what Michaela said, but also raises new points. Michaela, can I get first give you the opportunity to give some feedback and reflections on what what David said? This was a, a really a great comments by by David. Thanks a lot, David. Um, press just to um, uh, so. Uh, a few things. So then, let's start with the with the, the first uh, with the first point. So um, the importance of um, of national uh, policy frameworks, um, right? So I fully agree, David. This is uh, really important. So we talk a lot about EU policies and what regional policy actors are doing and what they are not doing, right? And sometimes we. Uh, forget the, uh, how how important uh, national policy programs and initiatives could be, and uh, yeah, I, I fully agree that uh, this is an, a, a key issue. Um, in the sense that you know, more often than not, uh, they really set the overall direction, and then it's uh, up to the regions to follow or not to follow, and. Um, if they don't follow, then uh, this is not always a, a good decision. I mean, it, it happens, we know that. So there are some examples where the national policies are not that favorable. So they, they, they are not really supportive for, for green path development by regional policies um, then to make a difference. But um, so in this case, now, as a deviating from the the national uh, framework is is certainly a good thing to do, but in most cases, and this have this is also what what we have seen is that policymakers tend to follow what national policymakers um, initiate, um, and this might be a good idea because otherwise, you know, the, the actors in the regions they are really confronted with. Uh, very different policy incentives, no? and there there is no clear direction for change, and there is also insecurity about okay, um, the uh, what should we do, and will there be um, no? uh, so in investment opportunities or opportunities for further greening uh, in also in two years? So I think this. This is a very important uh, aspect, so I've, I fully agree with you um, on that. Um, also, that we uh, also an issue that you raised and that I have already partly answered huh, about this more short term and long term incentives. This is really important for actors, not only for firms, but also for for other actors to have some. Um, yeah. Um, Stability is not the right notion, but to uh, not to be sure that uh, after the next uh, election uh, things won't be totally different, and we are uh, following it a, a totally different path. So, yes, so I agree. <laughs> is the, the message that I uh, I would like to to give you uh, the the other thing about the negative outcomes of green path development. Um, Yes, um, this is this is true, and I, I also agree that uh, now I think uh, so. You mentioned a green path importation as uh, as as one ex, uh, example. No? Uh, so, and it's it's true. Yes, we we know a lot from the previous policies that really sought to solve um, uh, regional development problems uh, heavily based on um, by attracting foreign direct investment. Uh, so Wales and also other, um, there are also other uh, examples in the UK and elsewhere. So it's true. I don't think that we have uh, forgotten that the question really is, um, 
what does this imply for 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 green path development and for policymakers seeking who are for example in less developed regions or in in locked in regions so who don't have that many potentials to given a, a, a limited asset base in the region don't have that many opportunities to develop a, a path from uh, uh, so totally endogenously from scratch or to engage in path diversification activities. So, and then there are chances not nah, to, uh, to import a path because uh, multinational companies find the location attractive or because there is an inflow of, of, of talented people or whatever. Nah? So what should we tell these regions? Don't do that. <laughs> and or um, yeah, I saw uh, I would um, I am not sure if, if, if this could be um, a, go a good solution. I think the key question really is um, and perhaps this could make a difference that it is not enough to um, to um, attract a green uh, a new a green industry to a region, uh, but the core question is really how to anchor it and how to embed it. And I think uh, if we take this into consideration, then um, I would say we have a strong argument for, for, for green path importation. So, and uh, concerning the, not the other negative outcomes, yeah, I'm fully aware of the potential negative outcomes of green path development. Um, and I think this is also the reason why I was arguing no, also in favor of, um, so from from a policy perspective take a close look at what what are the uh, economic benefits of green path development and uh, uh, how are green paths related to other paths because this could really make a difference no? it could be an, um, a, a green path or opportunities to develop a green path and there might be night nice grow, growth potential but um, Due to negative interpath dependencies, the, uh, there might be losses in other parts of the of the economy, which are higher than the, uh, the what could be gained by 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 the green path. So I'm fully aware of that and um, fully agree. Um, must also say that um, we have shied away a bit no, from these negative forms of path development. We have done, we have written one paper together with Yuri uh, Plasek and Simon Baumgartinger Seiringer and other colleagues on negative forms of path development, but this is really an, a thing that remains poorly understood and which uh, requires uh, much more work and I think it deserves more work because this is uh, also of relevance for for policymakers, right? So, yes. Uh, the ecological benefits, David, of green paths. What are the alleged um, benefits of green paths? Yeah, this is a really uh, tricky question, and it's uh, it's true that this is um, a very uh, contested issue, no? uh, as you have also written in in um, in in your papers. So, the, um, just think of. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, no, so the the products might be green or they might have a positive ecological effect, but we must of course not forget the way in which these uh, products or solutions are produced, and this is not always that green. So that needs also uh, be taken into consideration, of course. Um, and then another thing, uh, and I think I mentioned it at the beginning of my lecture, we also must ask ourselves, where are these ecological benefits created? No? Because, uh, you know, there are challenges and solutions and uh, sometimes we really have, uh, so taking the example of the, of the, um, um, offshore wind industry in Norway, this is an export industry. No? So, and there is as little to do with ec uh, ecological benefits in Norway. Or you mentioned uh, Styria in Austria, my, by the way, my home region, where no, they really managed to, to grow um, a green deck cluster, uh, so or different green deck clusters, let's put it like this. And uh, many of them are, uh, so I, I used for export. So has a, a positive effect for the economy, but what does that mean for the, um, for the 